When you hear the term bankruptcy, does an elder immediately come to mind? Probably not. Yet older Americans represent the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population filing for the protection of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. As many older Americans find themselves struggling under the weight of both credit card debt and medical bills, it is clear that since the Great Recession in 2008, many elders face economic challenges as they struggle to make ends meet. No doubt elder debt is a growing problem. Hello, my name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, and welcome to Your Money, Your Life. In this segment, my guest, B. Stankard of Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley, will assist me in discussing a variety of issues, such as can elder debt be minimized and reasonably handled? Is there an increasing awareness about this elder debt problem? What are the different types of debts that challenge older Americans? What are the warning signs family members should look for, indicating that an elder is struggling with debt? Does aging erode financial acumen? Is help available for elders who are overwhelmed by their debt? B, welcome to Your Money, Your Life. It's great to have you on the program. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, at Elder Services, do you see older adults who have financial difficulties? Yes, and I'm seeing more and more of them. What kind of financial difficulties do you see? The, probably the biggest one is credit card debt, and people are just overwhelmed with their credit card debt. My guess is probably because a lot of people, um, just when everybody was buying, they were buying mm -hmm. just like everybody else was. Different things have happened. People have thought they're going to work a lot older. Mm -hmm. That age of, well, I'm going to retire at 65, that's not happening. We had the recession. Right. The and 2008 Great Recession you're talking about. That's the one. That people who were on that edge of 64, 65 were probably the first ones let go. Mm -hmm. We have people who have a stroke, an illness that you don't expect, and aren't able to work as long as they thought. Loss of a spouse, does that become an issue? And does that result in more debt? Oh, yes. Is it fair to say that, that one in a husband and wife couple, that one usually will control the finances? Is that fair to say? It is. In many of the much older clients, the man had come home, given his paycheck to his wife, said, you take care of this. Then something happens to her, and he truly has no idea. So you mentioned that, that credit card, charge card debt is, uh, is what you see most often. And how many cards do they have? I've seen 10. 10, wow. I've seen somebody with just one that they can't handle. I would say probably the average that I see is three or four. And, and what sort of, if you don't mind my asking, what sort of limits do you see on these cards? High, well, high in my estimation, you'll see a limit of 5,000, 10,000. Mm -hmm. And if you miss one payment, you now, your interest rate goes up. Yeah, well, not, not only does the interest rate go up, but then, then you have fees that, that kick in as well. And those fees? Over the limit fees and non-payment fees and late fees and it just, I mean, you know, the, the debt goes through the ceiling. Now. So it's just, it absolutely snowballs. So how do you counsel them? I mean, how do you help them with regards to managing this, this charge card debt that obviously they're having a hard time paying? There's a couple of ways. The first one is obviously you're going to sit down and you're going to work with them. How much money do you have coming in? Mm -hmm. How can you pay these off? Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to call that credit card company and say, can you lower the interest rate for this person? Mm -hmm. I can call with the elder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll do it. Sometimes, amazingly enough, they'll say, we won't lower the interest rate until somebody misses two or three payments. Mm -hmm. There are nonprofit agencies, but take one payment from the client and then divvy it out to the various credit cards. You have to be sort of careful with that because the, there's a, the IRS consider the, the portion that's forgiveness of debt as taxable, as, as income. taxable income. Yeah, so you know, people have to be aware of that. So it may look really good if, you know, I'll use a hypothetical, you have, ten thousand dollar limit and you have let's say eleven thousand dollar debt and the, the creditor says listen you know you give us a one payment of five thousand dollars and we're gonna call it even well you know what the IRS is gonna say that six thousand dollars is taxable income exactly 
Do you find that, um, other than ch uh, credit card debt, do you find that, that elders run into issues with regards to straightforward mortgages? Uh, you know, I think everyone knows that we had uh, we had a real frenzy in terms of refinancing mm -hmm. from 2002 to 2007. We had a five-year window. I mean, you know, it seems like everyone and and their brother was was trying to refinance. Uh, did elders fall into that? Oh yes. And what happens is a lot of them fell into the adjustable rate mortgages. Mm -hmm. Now they can't afford it because, again, they were assuming they were going to be able to work for a much longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some precipitating event happened mm -hmm. and they can't. But what they didn't stop to think about is if you take that, fi and you know this, but if you take that 15 year mortgage, you've paid off seven years, you've paid a lot towards that interest. Right. Now they refinance for another 15 years, you've got all that interest that you have to, s the clock starts over on the interest. It does. And this, in a lot of cases, wasn't explained. And the payments, while they were lower than the original one, they're for a longer period of time. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that a lot of people viewed their homes in that, in that period, viewed their homes as an ATM, basically. I, I, I personally know of a, of, a, of a couple who were refinancing their home on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. And the rates kept falling. And you know the rates would fall at least one percent. They would refinance again and again and again and again. Unfortunately, as we sit here today, because the market corrected, the value of their home fell. They're sitting with 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 a mortgage that exceeds the value of, the value of their home. They're and underwater. They're underwater, and that's happening more and more. And the idea that well, I can sell my house and move into an apartment was a great idea mm -hmm. prior to. As the meltdown. As long, as long as you had equity, yeah. But now, you, you can't sell the house. Yeah, it's a very not slow market. What it, it, if you can sell it, you're probably not selling it for the amount of that mortgage. Mm -hmm. And the person is now, they're stuck. They don't have any place to go. Speaking of mortgages, there, there's another uh, type of mortgage, and uh, that's the reverse mortgage. And that, that's the mortgage that's specifically for people who are 62 and up, and you don't have to worry about making a monthly payment because there is no monthly payment. The whole situation works in reverse. However, the interest rate accrues over time. Um, have you found that, that older adults run into problems with the reverse mortgages? And if so, what kind of problems? There's a lot of problems with the reverse mortgage. The first one is if you're 62, you could live another 30 years. Mm -hmm. The idea of the reverse mortgage was to, uh, the true idea when they started them was to allow that person who bought their house maybe 35, 40 years ago for $45,000, that house may not, may have been worth say 450000 and mm -hmm. they couldn't afford to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford to stay there. Well now if they could take some of that equity, use that equity to pay the taxes, use that equity to insure a house that's 100 times more than mm -hmm. they thought it was ever going to be worth, and use it for maintenance, which, by the way, the reverse mortgage people insist that you do. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to pay the taxes. You have to ha keep it insured. You have to maintain it. Uh, no, absolutely. It's a condition of a reverse mortgage is that uh, you must pay the real estate taxes, you must pay the insurance, and you must keep the prop property properly maintained. And they actually reserve the right, I've never seen them do this, but they actually reserve the right to come in and inspect. I've seen them come in. You have seen them do that? I okay. have seen them come in. But the person took that at age 62, and they used it. Yeah. Now they're 72. Now they're. 85 and they've already used all of the money that they had because you can either draw it in monthly installments or you can take a one lump sum. That's true. And some people, it's even been advertised to people, take trips in your old age. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's using, again, your house as an ATM. Right, right, right. Take, you know, a few trips to Europe. You've used up all that money that's the equity in the house but you still can't afford to pay the taxes on that $450,000 house. And even though the value may have gone down, the taxes haven't gone down. They haven't looked at it and said, let's put the taxes down. Mm -hmm. 
So now the person can't afford it. Or they put huge, maybe unnecessary improvements into their house. Mm -hmm. I saw, saw a woman with the most gorgeous driveway I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the other issue that, that I've, I've seen with regard to reverse mortgages, and that is you have somebody who has uh, a home that they've lived in for, for, for many years, raised a family in Massachusetts, let's say. And, and you know, we have a fair number of snowbirds. You know, they, they go to Florida, they spend some time, and then they decide, you know what, for, for various reasons, let's declare Florida as our principal residence. Well, the reverse mortgage requires that the property against which you're taking the loan be your principal residence. So when you declare residence in Florida, you're technically in violation of that mortgage, which means technically it's due and payable. And they will do it. They will come after yeah. people. So, and that's, that's, you know, that's another issue. Um, you know, I think, I think a reverse mortgage, if, if it's the only alternative and somebody has a serious financial problem, it can work. Uh, I'll tell you that in the instances where I have uh, recommended reverse mortgages, it was usually situations where there was somebody who was diagnosed with a, with a medical condition where they didn't have that much longer to live. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so if they do this reverse mortgage and they pull out, and we've been using the number 100,000, so I'll stay with that, they pull out 100,000 and they only got three years to live? But if What's they, the big deal? But the big deal is they could be wrong. They could live another 10 years. Well, and you have to rely on the information the medical community gives you, right? But that's the problem. People say, well, I'll probably be gone in three years anyway, mm -hmm. so I might as well enjoy myself. Well, at 62, you really can't say that unless you've been diagnosed with, with some, some very serious condition, you know. Um, and they do. But I hear what you're saying. They do insist that before a person takes a reverse mortgage, they get a certain amount of counseling for that's it. That's right. It's required counseling that the borrower actually has to pay for. But they, um, and there is an organization, the Housing Options for Massachusetts Elders, that is qualified to do that counseling, and they're a nonprofit. Well, well, hopefully an agency like HOME can help educate people and, and help them understand how a reverse mortgage is helpful, but also how a reverse mortgage may, may in fact get them into trouble. It can. Yeah. Now, are there any particular warning signs that family members should look for when they have a, 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 a loved one who's, who's older in terms of significant debt? I would say the biggest thing is when you visit, just kind of look around. You're probably going to see piles of bills. Unopened bills. Unopened bills. Mm -hmm. Just piled up, just sitting there. And truly, the elder doesn't want his or her family to know. They're, they're embarrassed. Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. them to know. But if a, you know, an adult child is observant, you'll see the unopened bills. You'll see that parent may be getting very tense over something. One of the things, hard as it is to believe, you'll see a lot of scratch tickets around. No kidding, really. If I hit the big one on the scratch ticket, I can pay my credit cards. I can cards. pay everything, yeah. But they're probably yes. not paying any attention to what the, what the odds are. No, no, no. No. No, no. but, you know, that's, I have seen that time and time again. Yeah. Okay. They probably won't ask their children for a loan. No, I, I agree with you. No, they're not, they're not going to, they're not going to go there. But you're saying that they would have unopened bills all piled up, and that, that's, that's a real sign. It is. It's a real... So cool. how, how can an adult son or daughter broach that subject with, with an elder parent? What's the best way to do that? It's a really hard thing to broach because opening your wallet, opening your checkbook, opening your bills to your child, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And it has to be broached. You know, is there anything I can do to help with this pile? The other thing you can do is, truthfully, you can call Elder Services. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it comes better from somebody else. Right, right. I go out as part of the money management program. You know, do you need some help? Is there anything we can do to help? Mm -hmm. Not monetarily. We don't have money to give out. So you help people, like, pay their bills, write mm -hmm. checks for them, that sort of thing. Oh, that's very important. And also to not only write the checks for them, but prioritize. What do you mean by prioritize? You may have a, a bill for $29 that you can't, you just can't even pay that. Mm. Pay the $29 one and get rid of it. Cross that one off the list. Well, you know, there's a, <coughs> there's a budgeting technique and it's, it's very low tech. And if, if the person follows it, it can actually work really well. And it's, uh, it, 
it's what <laughs> it's it's basically a group of envelopes. You take the envelopes and you write on there rent or mortgage. You write on there uh, utilities, or you can put on there mm -hmm. telephone, gas, electric. I mean, you you kind of detail, and then you take your your you take them you take the cash that you think it's going to take, and you put it in that envelope. And you know what? When all the envelopes are empty, you're done. You're done. No more spending. And I suggest now that it takes discipline to follow that. I suggest that because it's really easy to go to that ATM, that magic money machine, and get the money out. But I take it one step further, and I learned this from a woman that I work with. Not only do you have an envelope for all your bills, but you have an envelope that you put all your receipts when you spend money into it. Mm -hmm. So even if you go to the store and buy a newspaper, put the little receipt you get and write on the envelope. Actually writing it down mm -hmm. is a reinforcement that I spent a dollar and a quarter. I spent a dollar ninety nine buying the magazine on the checkout mm -hmm. when I only went in to get milk. Take those each week and take a look at them. What did I spend the money on? Right. Right. And you know, our folks knew a lot when they put all their money in envelopes. Sure, sure. And I'm always amazed when a client will say to me, I'm thinking of going bankrupt. And I'll say, just kind of slide it into the conversation. Have you ever gone bankrupt? Oh yeah, about 10 years ago. Well, 10 years ago they were 50. They, their spending habits haven't mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. Well, you realize that the, the elder generation, uh, the number of bankruptcy filed is almost astronomical now. It's a huge number of bankruptcies they filed. So they obviously have gotten themselves into significant financial trouble. Do you find that there, there are some elders who go out and, and, and buy things unnecessarily and, and end up basically hoarding all kinds of personal property, stuff that may even still have the price tag on there. Oh. They've never worn it. Very definitely. And we have actually specialists who work with clients who hoard. Mm -hmm. But you find people who buy things, uh, the dollar store type places mm -hmm. you know you're only paying a dollar for it right but you're buying 20 of these little things <laughs> <laughs> so it's twenty dollars <laughs> worth of a dollar yeah. I've you know I've actually had uh, situations with clients and we only found out after the client had passed away because we have people that are going in to clean out the house and we're finding that the house has let's say four closets and the closets are jam-packed full the price tags are still on there. It doesn't even look like the garment. Many of the garments have even been worn. And they, but they have bought them. They but bought that's them. That's a whole. That's a different reasoning for spending money. But a lot of those people, you know, in terms of money in the bank, didn't have a lot. No. No. So you explained a little bit about the kinds of things that elder services can do for people who are in trouble. You can actually, you know, help them out in terms of budgeting. You can also. Uh, if, if they want to get on the phone with you, you can call and, and talk to people and try to work some sort of a, a plan uh, so that you know, they can start to make regular payments and try to, try to catch up on their debt. Is there anything else that people can do other than budgeting or, or trying to work out a plan with the creditor? Well, there is bankruptcy, and I do not become involved in that. You know, what I would do is refer them to an attorney. I don't become involved right. in anything that requires anything with, to do with the the law that's your job yeah, I, that's that's right that's what that's what we lawyers do um, you know, we don't want people to deny themselves but we also don't want people to go out and overspend and the next thing they know not only did it cost them you know forty dollars for that beautiful blouse but then you add the interest and the over the limit and the next thing you know it's a hundred dollar blouse you can explain that and I and I will and I will always say I'm not judging you mm -hmm. but did you see how much you did spend last week? Let's add it up. And I had one woman who was very, very angry about doing that. And finally she told me, she said, you're not helping me at all. Mm -hmm. And I recently did a program and she was in the audience and I was like, uh-oh. And when it came time to question, she put up her hand and she said, I hope all you people listen to her because she knows what she's talking about. Oh, nice. That's very nice, yeah. But uh, people have the right to spend money what I might consider foolish, you might consider foolish. Right. But it's their choice. Sure. And I will work with people making sure that the basic necessities are paid, the rent, right. the telephone. The necessaries of life. Right. Do you, do you ever have a situation where uh, an adult son or daughter calls 
because the parent really doesn't want to come into elder services. They call and they try to get you to uh, become involved with the parent who has a debt problem. Often I get referrals from the son and daughter. I will say, you know, you really need to, you know, let your mother know I'm coming. You know, my mother doesn't want you to come. Well, why don't we talk to her together? Are you willing to meet sure. me at your mother's? Sure. And it sometimes it works that way. So you actually go to people's homes? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I spend most of I'd say half more than half of my time, and then I have about sixty volunteers that once they are getting to a point that it really is more just basic budgeting, mm -hmm. then the volunteers take over. Now the top end of the baby boom generation has started to retire. Mm -hmm. Are you getting calls from baby boomers with regards to debt issues that they are having? Yes. Already? Already. Wow. The baby boomers are hitting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I would say most of my calls now are what you would call young elders. Because the baby boomers are, what, maybe 65, 66, yeah. the beginning of them. Are they still working or are they retired? Retired. retired. Many of them not by choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many who will say, I, I wish I could get a job. Well, you know, the, we, we have a significant long-term unemployed population in this country, and it's basically those 50 to 65, that's, that's that window, so to speak. So I could see where those, as you said, they're not working because there's no work. Primarily, what sort of financial problems do baby boomers have? I think probably, again, the biggest is credit card debt. Credit card debt. And that expectation that they were going to work, and now they're living on $1,200 a month. It's not a lot of money. No. No. And that's for somebody who's worked. Right. Right. And been contributing into the system. That's not, you know, someone who is at the, the lower end, it's around 800. Mm -hmm. But average is about 1,200 a month. And when you've been living. You're talking 1,200 after their, their, their Medicare payment, after that deduction? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 1,200 after the Medicare payment, but you still have to have an insurance, a Part D insurance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you pay for right. another insurance. And then there's a supplemental insurance. So. And that's not, a, that's not inexpensive. No. no. And even if you're living in subsidized housing, that's 30% of your income. Yeah. So take $400 off the top of that. Yeah. And most of the baby boomers, unfortunately, are not the ones that are going to have the pensions. Right. They but have 401ks. Okay, so what you're saying is they have minimal income, they have, they don't have enough savings, um, so really they've got the, the worst of both worlds. The worst of both worlds. They do. Wow. And it's, you know, in some way, in some of them, they're also supporting older parents. Right. You have the old sandwich generation, yeah. Which is the baby boomers. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be a lot of debt. Well, I mean, it, the, this, this debt issue is going to definitely mushroom for the simple reason that the baby boom generation is the largest generation in history. And if, if, if you're already seeing problems with the baby boom generation, imagine the problems you'll start to see as more of, the, more of them start to retire. Uh, it will. It'll mushroom. Well, we've, act we've actually gone through, in the uh, decade, the last decade, we've gone through basically three things. Uh, first of all, we had the bursting of the internet bubble. Yep. A lot of people lost money there. Then we had the recession following 9-11. Then we had the real estate craze. Uh, that credit bubble burst. A lot of people lost money there, lost their homes in some cases. Then we had the Great Recession of 2008. So, you know, in that decade, there's been a lot of things happening, and a lot of negative things happening. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no question that houses can be sold. There's no question if you were careful in terms of saving and you put money away, whether into an IRA or a 401k or 403b, as you mentioned, or if it's just in, a, in, your, own, in your own private account. Uh, what income can you actually develop uh, from, from those funds today? Interest rates with banks are very low. Money market funds are ex even lower. Uh, bonds are a very risky place to get into today. The stock market has always been risky, so where do you draw, where do you get this, this income? It's, it's, it's a tough situation that retirees face today. And that's why the whole budgeting issue becomes such a huge piece of it. 
I think I think at any age budgeting is a good idea, but uh, I think that's a good place for us to start. <laughs> Debt and seniors is a growing issue. It actually has become an unhealthy combination. The picture of elder life isn't always pretty. For some, the golden years feel more like tarnished years. One of the most prized goals in life is the ability to age with dignity while having one's needs reasonably met by social programs like Medicare and Social Security combined with private savings. However, facts reveal that older Americans find themselves struggling under the weight of both credit card debt and medical bills. As a result, many increasingly resort to bankruptcy. A 2010 University of Michigan Law School study called The Rise in Elder Bankruptcy Filings found that those 65 and older are the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population seeking bankruptcy protection. For many older Americans, there is now an alarming gap between their needs and their resources. The high cost of health care is especially daunting for many older adults. Even older adults who are reasonably well situated are now beginning to feel the pinch. Older Americans face a challenging and uncertain future. In the face of rising expenses, many retirees' incomes have at best a modest cost of living adjustment, or COLA. This modest COLA, of course, results in spending down a greater proportion of the principal in retirement savings. Also, it's important to consider if future changes to Social Security and Medicare will aggravate this already vulnerable financial situation. And if this isn't enough, older adults are also challenged by circumstances such as illness, loss of a spouse, downsizing, and or need for help with daily tasks. It is important to understand that this situation does not only affect lower income older Americans. Consider the enormous cost of long-term care with its potential to erode and even wipe out life savings which often hits middle-class elders especially hard. The wealthiest elders are able to afford private care, and those who are poor or have low incomes have recourse to Medicaid-sponsored long-term care. But for the middle-class elders, ineligible for long-term care through Medicaid precisely because they've not done any asset protection planning, there is no social safety net to help offset the staggering cost of long-term care. This already significant problem is likely to mushroom over the next decade as aging baby boomers, who represent the largest generation in American history, struggle to meet their material needs. The truth is, as we grow older, our ability to make sound financial decisions degrades. But with education and preparation, we can maintain healthy finances well into old age. For in the words of Ben Franklin, and investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. In closing, I would like to thank my guest, B. Stankert of Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley for her participation in this program. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, Building Your Trust.